And if you ever tell people that God does not have fierce wrath towards the sinner, not just the sin, but towards the sinner, then you're lying to them. Because I don't find verses that speak and show God to pour out wrath on sin. What's that? What's, how do you pour out wrath on sin? Where is it? Listen to this. I'm just going to give you five verses that deal with God's wrath. You tell me who the recipients of the wrath are. Exodus 22, 22. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword. Leviticus 26, 27. But in spite of this, you will not listen to me, but walk contrary to me. Then I will walk contrary to you in fury. 2 Kings 22, 13. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book and do according to all that is written concerning us. Ezra 8.22, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek Him, and the power of His wrath is against all who forsake Him. Psalm 21.8, your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath, and fire will consume them. Folks, His wrath is directed against sinners, not just sin. Let me tell you something else about His wrath. It's fearful. There's no other way to put it. It is infinitely dreadful. So often it's likened to fire. I find various times it's likened to drinking a cup, even the dregs of the cup, which I think is where we get the picture that Christ uses when He's in the garden. If it was possible, He was praying to His Father that He would be delivered from that cup, a cup of wrath. But more times than anything else in the Bible, you tell me, you listen to this, you hear what this wrath is likened to. Exodus 15, 7, you send out your fury, it consumes them like stubble. 2 Kings 53, 26, the burning of His great wrath. Psalm 21, 9, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in His wrath and fire will consume them. Isaiah 66, 15, for behold, the Lord will come in fire and His chariots like the whirlwind to render His anger and fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. Jeremiah 4, 4, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Ezekiel 21.31, I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath. Ezekiel 38.19, my blazing wrath. Jeremiah 17.4, In my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Isaiah 30.30, 30, in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire. Deuteronomy 32.22, for a fire is kindled by my anger and it burns to the depths of Sheol, devours the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Deuteronomy 29.20, the anger of the Lord and His jealousy will smoke against that man. Folks, 
This is one of the most fearful verses that I have ever read in the Bible. Ezekiel 22.20 20. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it in order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath, and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. You know what? Man wants to ignore it. He wants to forget it. He wants to suppress it. <laughs> And man likes to think, oh, my sin isn't that bad. And God isn't that angry. And man somehow thinks some way, somehow, well, even if hell's real, I'm going to be down there with all my friends. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath and you shall be melted in the midst of it. Man thinks he's going to stand up to it. But I tell you what, when God blows upon him with the wrath of his vengeance, with the fires, a smoke, a blaze, man will yield immediately. There will be no fight in him. He will succumb to that wrath. Folks, the wrath of God is fearful. And I'll tell you this, nothing but sin brings out this characteristic of God. Wrath is the way a holy God does respond and to the wickedness of men. But I'll tell you a third thing about this wrath. It's righteous. Listen to this. This is in Romans 2 verse 5. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You know what most men feel? They feel that the wrath of God If it's as bad as the Bible says it is, if, if, if the, and the Bible says it's terrific, it's terrifying to the uttermost, if it's that bad, man looks at it and says, wait a second, if it's that bad, this is excessive. God's going overboard here. Man cannot conceive of God having such a massive reaction on God's part to our little sins. So they, so they look at... They, they, this can't be. This is, this is overkill. I'll tell you what. The problem is not that God is excessive it's not that he's extreme. It's not that he's disproportionate. The Bible says his judgment is righteous. Folks, the problem is we underestimate the degree of our crime, our guilt, our guilt is on a level that we know not. The problem lies not in our assessment of His wrath. The problem lies in our assessment of the excessiveness of our sin. That's where it lies. God's wrath shouldn't make us think of an overreacting God. It should make us think of underestimating foolish men. God's wrath is reasonable if we understand 
our sin. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. One thing about Scripture, it just drops it like a ton of lead right on you. So absolute. Why? I mean, come on, John. Give us a little slack here. Can I love some, some things in the world just a, a little? Why does it... Why does it seem like so often Scripture just... <laughs> I mean, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Period. You know why? You know why I have to believe that? Because just like with the rest of John, if you come along and you say you know Him and you don't keep His commandments, bang! Again. Just boom! Hit you with a ton of lead. You're a liar. Mm. Brethren, the reality is this. It's like Paul Washer said before. If you came in this door right now and you told us you just got hit by an 18-wheeler and you look just like you all look right now, we'd all say you're lying to us. I don't think that's, that's the basic weight of the matter. He's saying, look, when you're born again, and when you're indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is so radical, and it so produces a love for God and a hate for this world that it is so stark, it is so real, it is so obvious that is there a battle? Well, yes, there's a battle because obviously we've got to wage war against these anti-soul forces, one of which is the world that we're not to be conformed to, we're not to love it, and so there is this fight not to do it, but it is so real, and it is so... It, brethren, it isn't the kind of thing where you live your life in love with the world all the time and you're trying to get out the magnifying glass and stare and look and strain and squint to figure out if you're a Christian or not. The truth is, this is so, this is so obvious when it happens to somebody's life. It takes them where they're in this course and it totally spins them around so obviously that, brethren, I've seen it. I've seen this happen to people. The worldliness just starts to fall off one after another. It falls off. And I'll tell you this, people that have supposedly had this amazing, this amazing transformation happen in their life and conversion, and all of a sudden, two, three, four, five years down the road, the worldliness just hasn't fallen off. Brethren, just, there's no truth to it. Mm -hmm. you, you say, well, you can't say that. You're judging. I can say that because God's Word says that. If that person shows by a continuous ongoing lifestyle that they're in love with the world, they do not love God. They are those adulteresses and adulterers that James is dealing with, and they're at enmity with God. Lay it down. Hands down, folks. This is, this is absolute. I mean, this is... Brethren, yes, there's a battle. I don't, I don't doubt that. But this is a battle for life and death. And that's what we're told here.